Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. Hi, I'm Deb Radcliffe, host of SciB podcast for ITSP. When Schwartow was educating government and private sector about Infowar in the 1980s, in 1991, he coined the term electronic Pearl Harbor when testifying to Congress. And in 1996, he was named the civilian architect of information warfare by a Commodore in the OBE Royal Navy. In the early days, Wynn was laughed out of D.C., just as I was being laughed at for asking the tough questions as a cybercrime journalist. But there's no stopping a force like Wynn, who grew into a respective reputation as an author and info war preparedness, preparedness expert. In the late 90s, I remember standing outside of one of his war rooms where he put public and private sector response teams through the ringer in his cyber war response exercises, quote unquote, no journalists allowed because people break down and cry in these exercises. Looking back, he was spot on with all of his predictions and warnings, which is why I'm excited to have him participate in this series where we define cyber war, info war, and electronic warfare. After decades on the info war beat, he's now coined another term, meta war, which we will also discuss in this podcast. Welcome, Wynn. Hey, Deb. Well, we go so far back. When did we actually? Don't go, don't, don't, don't go there. That's fine, fine. I, I, all of the books I'm reading now are in are, are women heroines in Victorian age, so I'm good. Okay. Well, my series is a woman heroine too, Breaking Backbones Hacker Trilogy. And there's an AI named Telos that's starting to out bad guys on social media by posting irrefutable proof of their misdeeds and swaying their mobs and authorities to go after them. To me, that is a form of info war. But you have a better definition of info war. How have you historically defined info war? Information warfare, uh, the definition that, I guess this goes back to the late 80s, is information warfare is the use of information and information systems needed to both attack and defend against other information and information systems. So cyber war is a subcomponent of information warfare. Electronic warfare is a subcomponent of it. Cognitive warfare, as uh, the Russians have been doing for over a century, and Machiavellian, that is another component of information warfare. Information warfare is the umbrella, and then there's a variety of sub-disciplines within that. Okay, that makes great sense. But lately, you've actually been talking about meta-war. I wrote an article about metaverses and the security risks for CISOs in CSO about six months ago. And so I would love to hear your definition of meta-war, because when I wrote that article, it was already scary enough to see how you could actually... Uh, trick the human brain and sensory systems. And you're actually calling that our next battleground in meta war. So how are you, how are you describing that and how can right. it be? Well, meta war uh, is the art and science of creating immersive experiences to influence, alter and define your sense of reality. It, it's a battle for control over your identity, sense of truth and belief systems outside of your conscious awareness. Globally, MetaWar will represent the sixth domain of global conflict. Wow. And how do you see that playing out? Because I listened to your RSA speech on this was very good. You talked, you went pretty scientific on how the brain works, how our sensory systems work, and how most of what we see, we don't really see. Most of what we experience is based on memory. So how can all of that be leveraged in a metaverse where you actually combine maybe even AI, which you also talk about, to influence uh, people? It's, it, it's really, it, all in the new book, obviously, because it, it takes a while and there's a lot of pictures. But what's going on is 
we're used to technology and the computers, yada, yada, yada. And we're getting more and more in, involved and sucked in with them. Fair enough. But the systems, when you do a systems analysis in the time domain of technology, you come up with some numbers that show how to make security work, how to make privacy work. And that's all been mathematically proven. Now you come along to humans and you look at things that we speak of in uh, the cyber domain. What is uh, the trigger that causes a sequence of events to create a reaction? And how does that reaction create uh, a, a, a response to a particular stimuli? And we're, we're used to thinking about it in, in cyber terms, but in human terms, it's the same. When we try to get these systems the carbon system, us, and the silicon system, technology to merge with each, with each other, we are operating at a thousand to 10 million times different run rates. How are we going to learn how to coexist with the technology that is that much faster than us? And that is the exploration uh, that I go through, both technically and socially. Can you name your book for us here on the Meta War? Yeah, it's I, I should look up the name of it, shouldn't I? Because I'm not quite sure yet. We'll be including a link to Win's site yeah. at the end of this broadcast. Well, the Art and Science of Meta War, how to coexist with AI-driven reality distortion, disinformation, and addiction in the metaverse. Oh, addiction is another thing I listened to when I listened to your RSA uh, session. Uh, so there's a lot of different areas that you covered. All of it was pretty chilling because people are people and we're already so... The problem. Yeah, right? Because here's the problem. We created technology, and I use arbitrarily 1952 as the beginning of the computing age for geeky reasons. We created technology and now we are creating AI we're creating them all in our own image, just like an alleged God created humanity in its own image. Mm -hmm. We are creating technology and notably AI in our own image, and we don't like what we see, which should give us a huge amount of pause for introspection before we keep deploying this shit out there. Right. So social media, for example, that was the latest step to where we are going now, the uh, ability to sway opinion and change people's minds and uh, build a terrorist network and everything else in between is happening in front of us on social media. Did you ever read Neil Stevenson's book, The Seven Eves, which is about, yes. okay, yes, remember how they destroyed each other over social media and the space colony? And most yes. of it was lies? Uh, social media what, what was bragged upon to be an egalitarian democratization of everybody on the planet for an equal voice. And all of that could have been true if Zuckerberg and those others had kept their algorithms the hell out of the thing that are pure profit or motivation, period. So that's already been admitted. And there's a awful lot of exposure of uh, Meta Platforms, Inc. in the book to go and with their own quotes. Their own quotes are so damning, it's like listening to some idiot ex-president politician nail himself in the foot, and the same thing's happening with the social media companies. They're admitting it. They're admitting it's about addiction and money and that they're leveraging uh, algorithms. You keep algorithms the hell out of it, and at least we might stand a little bit of chance because that's just more bias in the system. That's right. And as you said before, everything is money driven. How do you see money driving the metaverse? And then what kind of um, experiences do you see coming out of that for people? Well, th th this is a long haul. The, the, the ostensible goal and vision is that we will be able to put on a helmet or some such wearable, walk into roadblocks and have an absolute ball walk into Ready Player One and live it and experience it. But before you get there, uh, and that's many decades away, you got to understand much more about the human condition and what creates reality. Um, one of the examples I, I use about uh, reality shifting, and we just discovered my grandson, and I thought it might be, is colorblind. 
And no, stop it with the, oh, poor you person. No, it's just a thing. Uh-huh. And so we sat at the computer, went through the whole colorblind test, and his is identical to mine. Okay, so at least I can help him in that area. But my reality, my grandson's reality, is different than somebody who's not colorblind. And my daughter was watching us take this colorblind test. said, what do you mean you can't see it? <laughs> and that would be, um, what do you mean you can't see the UFO? What do you mean you can't see Jesus on mic? What do you mean you can't? And these are all different realities. We have the ability to fundamentally shift people's realities because we neuroscience has started to figure out how belief systems are created, how they're reinforced. And uh, the last act, what I call act three of the book is about how we as uh, humanity have to learn how to coexist and we're going to have to adapt ourselves to coexist with technology. Uh, Otherwise, game over. Game over. And that's how we're all going to be going into the virtual world anyway, as gamers, haptic suits, goggles, sensors. Metaporn. Deb, it's all metaporn. Take everything you just say, add sex to it, and it has nothing to do with driving a car. (laughs) <laughs> you and I both know that's the first thing that started on the internet to make money. Yeah, that's what Avenue Q says. The internet is for porn. Wow. I remember the days, man, when we were chasing down some of the bad guys who were doing kitty porn on the internet and stuff, too. Um, so the question then about the money side, all this mm-hmm. tactile, you, you say that we're putting a lot of money into this, but only the big tech companies who are already the biggest offenders today, like Zuck, have the funding to push us this direction to create these virtual worlds. It's all very expensive right now. I'm wondering though, with the use of AI, if the costs will come down for creating these worlds. No, no, it won't come down because number one, in order to get there, the fundamental cognitive infrastructure of the planet, web 3.0, if you will, you know, whatever term you want to use, has to be developed. Uh, The planet's gonna have to be 6G on steroids in order to be able to deliver true immersive experiences and create the feedback loops that are necessary in order to complete the experience and make it believable. That's so you're looking at a few trillion dollars right there just for communications, new infrastructures. Uh, You're going to be re-architecting the entire internet or whatever it evolves into, into layers of servers. It's not going to be a single cloud. It's going to be a layers of servers. They're going to be defined by their latency. The latency will become the new distributed denial of service because you have to synchronize all of the layers of the experience based upon time and rendering that occurs ultimately at the body area network of the endpoint. And in order to synchronize that, there's going to be another communications protocol that's going to be necessary to make all of them talk to each other. Else, we are going to have a lot of glitches in the matrix. So... Given all of that, that doesn't even address the issue of content. Content development is going to be um, where we have to learn how to specifically target people to get not, yeah, maybe click on this or click on that, but what's going to happen is PII, personally identifiable information, is going to disappear. It's going to be meaningless and worthless. It's going to be replaced with personally identifiable behavior. If I pin you with a red, blue, and a fuzzy cat and all that, and I'm getting all your biosensors all the way back, and I get yet you're actually now purring, well, I just found a button for you. And with AI on the back end of this, with the complete total lack of privacy and protection over PIB, as specified by Meta Platforms Inc. in their uh, user manual, they will sell and or give away all of that information without your permission because you just clicked OK on the EULA. Oh, wow. That's the part that I talked to in C- my CSO article was advertisers first will come in and they'll be able to see how excited you get about a product or a placement in a, a virtual world and they can take off from there and that there are no real laws or controls being developed 
around this, you know, this potentiality. Yes, well, yes and no. If, if you look at some of the European Commission guidelines and regulations, and they're trying to do some more laws on this, is at the back end of it, they have a thing called explainable AI. If you're using uh, any sort of technology that has an AI backbone and has an impact upon humans, you have to be able to explain it. That's still really fuzzy. But if we're going to do a uh, meta content uh, creation, meta content orchestration and distribution and have the back end driven by AI and it's addictive, then I'm finding really pretty good political support in Europe right now on the thesis. Good, because you've been all over the place, right? You've been to Canada, Europe, Asia, talking about this. I haven't done any Asia. I'm treating okay. I've done Canada and a, a lot of Western Europe. Okay. And, and that's Europe, part of it, the EU is going to be the easiest, probably, and Canada, because of their concerns over privacy, and they care more about humanity than Americans do. I know. I've always wondered why we've taken so long to adopt the, the European privacy standards here in the U.S. We we aren't even there yet with our current platforms. We always tend to, when it comes to technology, at least here in the U.S., is, hey, we got this cool new thing. Let's do it. Let's worry about everything else later, the cart before, before the horse thing. And I know you have been in this industry longer than I have. And I'm assuming that's how you see it too. Let's just push it out first. Let's worry about the controls later. It is it is politically and financially expedient to always kick the can down the street. Mm -hmm. See, I, that makes total sense. Um, so the money thing again, going back to that, if we're looking at uh, things like latency, rebuilding an inter a networking infrastructure and the cloud-based layers that are required to make this happen. So latency is something that if we're having a human reaction to something and there's any latency in the application, that's going to be uh, proof to us that we are not dealing with reality. Eventually though, they're gonna get there. How long do you think that's going to take? You said 10, 20 years? It's gonna be a continuum like everything else. Uh, the next big step I'm going to predict we will start seeing in second quarter 2024 with how the developers have handled spatial computing with the new Apple heads, headwear. Okay. I and think that is because technically, I mean, I've read all the patents mm -hmm. and uh, there's some rather amazing stuff in there. And if the app developers are going to do something that is a really cool platform to experiment with that I'm interested in because on conventional a uh, VR headsets, I get sick in because of the built-in latency problems. I can't, I can't do the teacups for God's sakes. Okay. I can't even watch my kids on a swing because <laughs> I get sick and that's fine. That's because of my reality distortion. And it's all going to be on a continuum. We're going to inch forward, inch forward, inch forward. And, you know, some people say it's the frog in the frying pan. And may, if that's the case, even though that metaphor doesn't hold up biomedically, uh, we got to start putting some brakes and guardrails on some of this shit now. Because the longer we wait, the harder it's going to be. Big tech is controlling the entire damn thing. And Zuckerberg doesn't give a fuck about anybody's privacy. Right. So that takes me to my last question. How can people get a hold of your book? Where is it being sold? And <laughs> who should be reading it? You know, that that's funny. Who should read it? Everybody should read the damn thing. I, I, I have a grandson to feed. Um, the book right now is available uh, for pre-order only on Amazon Kindle. Okay. The pre-order for the paperback is not there because I have not yet figured out how to make sure that the Ingram Spark and Amazon platform synchronize correctly. So I've been battling that, but uh, it'll be out in December. Out in December. That's really soon. So audience, keep Maybe January. I mean, I, I, don't mess with me, Deb. I don't okay. know. 
I, I, this project began as initially this project began was I'm going to take a technical look at the metaverse. That was how it began. Okay. What I did not know was that I was going to experience my own personal metanoia, a complete rewriting of my entire worldview from technology into consciousness. And writing this book has exposed an awful lot of what it really means to be a human, both from a, we as an engineering system in our body and our brain and all that, but how we may, some future predictions get into some uh, extrasensory issues, uh, some the difference between provability, falsifiability, and why would I take that off the table unless I could do either one of those would defy the scientific method. So I, at the very, very end, there is some speculative thinking that scares the shit out of people. So that, that was fun. Oh boy, I can't wait to get a copy. Will you be sharing autographed copies? And if so, can we order them? I have no time? idea how to do that. I don't think I can do that with a, uh, with a print on demand. Okay, all right. Uh, you know, I do have one more question because some of our audience people are corporate people. What does this mean to them? For example, will they be sending their employees in the metaverse to have meetings? Will they be using the metaverse to advertise? What would you recommend? Or is there anything in the book there too that re has recommendations for corporations? That's under, yeah, that's under class two information warfare. Uh, they've already entered the metaverse. They entered the metaverse really strongly in March of 2020. What happened? Zoom. Oh, Zoom, yeah, like this call right now. Suddenly, okay. Zoom became the thing. There were other platforms out there that really, most of them sucked. And Zoom zoomed onto the scene, and now it is, we Google. We you have a fridge. We have Kleenex, and we have Zoom. So Zoom is an alternate reality. It is part of the cognitive infrastructure that is being evolved. Now, if we had had Zoom, let's say the equivalent of uh, 20 years ago, we might have a picture update every second, we'll say. Just the picture, picture, like some early video was. Oh, right. Now, we're probably operating here, I'm guessing, at HD at 2997 would be my guess. Could we do it at 60? Sure. It, does that help the experience? Not for this purpose. But when you go into a fully immersive experience, one of the goals is called retinal quality. And we really don't have that yet with one exception, which is very cool. And retinal quality means that we need to have a completely immersive visual experience that runs at approximately 77 frames per second, being able to resolve 576 million pixels every 13 milliseconds. That's a lot. And that is where you... I started looking at this thing and I go, wait a minute, the brain can't do that. And going through the compression and how these systems all work and this reality that we think we see, we only see about 2% of it. When you're looking forward at anything, and you see the whole room around you. You only see 2% of it. The rest of it is your memory filling it in with appropriate time delay synchronization created in the brain. Memory. And that plays in the metaverse how? Because as we integrate, as we, as we do this right now on Zoom, if it's not synchronized, it's fucked up. If you watch TV and the lips are out of sync by 10 milliseconds, it can be really, really disturbing. It is. So whatever flavor of the metaverse, people think that the metaverse is only going to be about um, Neil Stevenson kind of stuff. I'm going to give you the fundamental meta, meta war thesis. Meta war thesis is fundamentally storytelling. We have been telling stories since the dawn of humanity, whether it's pictures, cave drawings, whatever. Storytelling is fundamental to all human communications and creates an immersive experience, which brings the audience inside the story. 
which relies upon reality distortion to make the narrative convincing by the use of disinformation to form mental images through which the story is told. Now, using manipulation of the, of the participant's worldview and belief system allows alteration to occur. And then you add reward systems to target the human mind with digital opioids, developing an addiction to the narrative. The storyteller can then induce behavioral compliance through repetition and fear. That's how to create undying absolute belief. That is the meta war thesis. And that is scary as heck. Okay. Anything else you'd like to add before nope. we sign up? No, nope. no, nope. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, I know, I'm, a, I'm a shitty interview. I know. I know. Everybody, the Win Schwartz website has all this information, including a thesis on MetaWar and eventually how and where to order his book. It is winschwartz.com, W I N N S H W A R. No, nope, S C H. S C H W A R T A U.com. We will be posting a link to this in the notes around this podcast. Also, for information on my books that also touch on these subjects, but in a different form and maybe not in the same definition that Wynn is using, look up my book at debradcliffe.com, and that will also be in the supporting materials around this podcast. Thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in, and Wynn, always a pleasure to do it. No, this was fun. I, I get to be free. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you learned something new and this story made you think, then share ITSP Magazine with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our columns. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society.